meeting is being recorded. Okay, this is uh, video number eight. So right now we're in the process of discussing the consequences of leverage on distress and more importantly, the consequences of uh, the possibility of distress. So last time we discussed the uh, case of uh, the, the problem of debt overhang, which means, uh, which is this idea that when bankruptcy is a positive probability event, uh, a corporation may have a tendency to pass on positive NPV projects. Why? Because there is a possibility that the payoff of the project will need to be taxed in order to meet uh, obligations that we have to existing debt holders. And it means that uh, even though the project as a standalone project may be a positive NPV project, if it is part of a corporation that's on the brink of bankruptcy, it may no longer be a positive NPV project. So we did the math the other day. And oh, so by, by the way, uh, today is going to be a little bit uh, chatty. I, there's, there's going to be no Excel in this particular video. So you know what that means. It means that I'm going to have a hard time testing you on any of what we're talking about in this video. So you can relax, you can, um, you know, grab yourself a non alcoholic uh, drink and just sit back and uh, listen to the stories. Now, the stories I'm going to tell you are important so I, I i would like you to pay attention but it is going to be on the chatty side so but the other day it was not that chatty we actually did uh, we worked out um, numbers to explain how debt overhang works but you can uh, see what debt overhang does also using um, uh, a few graphical representations it's actually quite easy so this is a slide here which i stole from uh, a man called Daryl Duffy, who's at Stanford, and he's probably one of the top five biggest names in academic finance. So he came a few months ago to give a talk here at Wisconsin, or maybe it was last year. And he his talk was about the debt overhang problems um, that financial intermediaries in the United States have been experiencing since 2008. But uh, as part of this talk, what he gave us uh, was this graphical representation of the debt overhang problem, which I thought I would share with you because it's um, it's really, really nice. So what you have here are two versions of the corporation that we were looking at the other day. One is the version without the new project and two is the version with the new project so you basically acquire new assets and as we said you need new equity to acquire those new assets and uh, the equity that you raise has to be enough to finance the um, uh, assets that you're adding to the corporation. And by the way, whether this new equity is provided by the old equity holders or raised externally, it doesn't matter. In the end, it's got to finance the new project and it has to get the return that it needs to get. But here's the problem. When a corporation like this, which has a risk of bankruptcy, adds a new asset, what happens is the market value of that goes up. Why? Because before we were in a situation where the debt, uh, the debt holders expected only so many cash flows in the last period with the corporation as is, and all of a sudden we add a positive NPV project. So that means that the expected cash flows that debt is going to get given the possibility of bankruptcy has gone up. So that means that the market value of debt goes up. And so you see this is this little blue encroachment encroachment in the in the figure here well this right here is a transfer from equity holders to debt holders the equity holders are financing the new projects and they are getting the cash flows from the new projects except they also are effectively making a transfer to the debt holders because some of those cash flows are going to go to those debt holders so as it says here and this is the way um, Myers put it in 1977. Uh, so for the investment to make sense, it has to be that the profits from the investment exceed the value transfers to creditors, the value transfers to debt. So this is a, a, another payoff uh, that I need to compensate for when I invest in this project. So that's it. That's debt overhang. And the bottom line is, for uh, just to repeat, when a corporation is on the brink of bankruptcy, it is going to have a tendency to pass on projects, positive NPV projects that it 
otherwise would and should take. So that's bad. Obviously, that destroys value. But a related problem, and in some sense, the opposite problem that is going to happen when you are on the brink of bankruptcy is a corporation is going to have a tendency to take on negative NPV projects. So before we were destroying value by passing on positive NPV projects, but we're also going to destroy value as a corporation on the brink of bankruptcy by taking on projects that do not make any sense as standalone projects. But because we are on the brink of bankruptcy, we, uh, we may actually uh, do this, do those crazy investments. And this is what we call gambling for resurrection for reasons that will become obvious in a moment. So all we have to do to understand gambling for resurrection is change the example that we had the other day, but this time the debt holders are going to be owed $100 million in the final period. So what does that mean? It means that even in the best case scenario, equity holders are wiped out. So this is a, a corporation which is a debt corporation walking. There is uh, at this point the equity holders know that uh, they're going to uh, default and that their residual cash flows are going to be zero. So now let's take let's think about a crazy crazy project and the new project uh, and this is already a crazy assumption, but let's assume that it costs nothing. This is a, uh, um, a project that the corporation can take on at no cost. And let's assume that it's going to generate just $10 in the good state. So the good state is where I get $100 million from the corporation and then a very, very, very negative payoff in the bad state. So here I'm exaggerating the trade a lot just to make the case that we are looking at a project which as a standalone project would never ever make any sense for the corporation but here it does make sense for equity uh, existing equity holders and the shareholders uh, that are representing them why does it make sense because if i'm a shareholder the fact that i may lose a uh, this number here however uh, um, it looks like a billion dollars i cannot count the zeros that fast uh, in the bad state is irrelevant to me because my payoff right now as an equity holders is zero here is zero here if i lose this much money it is still going to be zero here but here it's going to become ten dollars so i am willing to take crazy projects just to uh, just hoping for a miracle and the fact that i'm taking on more risk is, has become irrelevant to me because of limited liability so here we are taking on a project which is clearly a bad bad project but because i'm dead already as an equity holder i may taking on just as a massive gamble as i'm about to get wiped out anyway Okay, so this is always going to be a consequence of limited liability because of limited liability equity holders may not bear the entire consequences of their decisions and therefore they may not make uh, decisions that are in the best interest of the corporation. And so now it should be obvious what we call why we call uh, this gambling for resurrection. Um, so here we have the, one of the two big consequences of being on the brink of bankruptcy, passing on positive NPV projects, taking on crazy projects and hoping for uh, a miracle. So obviously we've done this in the context of very simplistic examples. The simplicity of the numerical side of the examples is irrelevant. I mean, we could complicate those numbers, the story, the fundamentals of the story would not matter. But one simplification here, which is very important is we have not talked about reputation effects, the reputation of the manager and even the reputation of shareholders that would push the manager into this crazy um, behavior. Obviously, doing things that are hurting the corporation for which you are working or uh, the corporation that you're controlling is going to have consequences down the road because people will remember that um, uh, you engaged in this crazy behavior. So we are overlooking this, obviously, the reputation consequences, but we are saying that at least there are some incentives to engage in behavior that is going to destroy value for the corporation. And you can imagine that for a corporation that is truly on the brink of bankruptcy, that kind of behavior is going to happen uh, quite often. And in part because your reputation at that point is probably not that high as a manager.
So that's it. That was Debt Overhang and Gambling for Resurrections, uh, two of the biggest ideas in optimal capital structure. And now what I want to do is uh, with, with the idea of trying to give you a complete story of what we have learned in corporate finance, in academic corporate finance, since the seminal paper of Modigliani and Miller, I want to discuss quickly in a rapid fire uh, kind of way other consequences of capital policy. One, uh, so this goes back to a paper, a very influential paper by Janssen in 1986. So this is the so-called free cash flow uh, idea. So what is the free cash flow idea? Yet another consequence of leverage is that when you enter into a debt contract, you promise certain payments to uh, stakeholders. So in other words, you commit yourself to distributing cash flows. And what Jensen said is that there's something good about distributing cash flows, which is that if you leave too much, too many cash flows on the table for managers and shareholders to enjoy, they may have a tendency to engage in bad behavior, as he would put it, to enjoy perks, the fact that they are in control of all that money, uh, they may uh, lead those managers and those shareholders to do things that are detrimental to uh, the corporation. So as I mentioned, perks, so the idea is if the, there's a lot of cash sitting around in the corporation, they may choose to uh, hold their meetings in very, very nice and expensive locations instead of uh, doing something that would be more reasonable. Uh, if there are fewer uh, less cash if there is less cash flow around because a lot of those cash flows are being distributed to uh, debt holders that tendency is not going to be there so much there is also the tendency on the part of managers and um, uh, shareholders to engage in so-called empire building so this is a uh, size of my empire in the utility function it makes me happy to deploy money and have control over more assets and that's independently of whether or not those assets are generating cash flow so again jensen uh, wrote uh, uh, this paper saying that one of the key advantages of debt is it forces the corporation to distribute cash flows on a regular basis, which limits the temptation that uh, managers and shareholders are going to feel to engage in bad behavior. So this is Jensen, 1986. This is the free cash flow idea. And the key here is that the free cash flow idea, just like the interest tax shield idea, is that it says that initially having some debt is a good thing. This is going to be a benefit of uh, taking on more debt. Okay, good. So that was idea number one. Idea number two is this idea that low leverage means that you have more dry powder. So we, we're lucky here at the University of Wisconsin to have one of um, the leading authority on the subject, his name is Tim Radio, is in the real estate department, and he's made that case uh, in the real estate context often and in a variety of um, papers. So what's the idea here? You remember that what makes a corporation valuable in addition to assets in place, it's also growth opportunities. Uh, the fact that every now and again, options to invest in very profitable projects are going to become available to the corporation. If you are already levered to the max, what's going to happen is if you have to take on those projects and uh, if you need to raise financing quickly by going to a bank or by going to debt markets, you may not be able to do so uh, as quickly as you can to fully take advantage of the opportunity. So maintaining low leverage, especially in an environment which is ripe with growth opportunities in a particular industry, is going to be a good thing. So you want to keep uh, some of your powder dry. And so you may wonder, you know, what about equity? Why don't I raise equity to take advantage of the growth opportunities? Raising equity in general is more complicated, uh, takes more time, takes more work, is more costly than raising debt. We will talk about this again uh, in a few moments in this video. Uh, so in any event, this is uh, another strand of work on optimal capital policy. The idea that uh, being uh, 
uh, reasonable in terms of leverage is good because it enables you to take advantage of growth opportunities when they come. And again, the name here is Team Radio in the real estate department of the University of Wisconsin, and you can go and read uh, some of his papers. Uh, another uh, area of uh, capital policy that we have not discussed yet is that when you issue debt, you have a choice between issuing debt that is secured by a specific asset and debt that is unsecured. In other words, uh, a loan that is, of course, collateralized by all the assets of the corporation, but is not collateralized by the um, by a specific asset. So what's an example, the main example of a secured piece of debt, it is uh, a mortgage in the real estate area. So this is um, a debt that is secured by a real estate property. And so the question then is, if you are a corporation, how do you choose whether to uh, go secured or unsecured? Well, that turns out to be a difficult calculation. On the one hand, when you secure debt with a specific asset, you're going to get to borrow at a lower rate. So why is that? It is because debt holders know that they are the primary claimant to a very specific of usually tangible property that they can claim. Uh, in the event of default, since that gives them additional security, an option, a specified option that they would not have otherwise, it means that secured debt is going to be cheaper than unsecured debt. But the problem with secured debt, because it is attached to a specific asset, it usually comes with a number of specifications on the part of uh, debt holders. And again, the principal example, the cleanest example of this is mortgages. When you issue a mortgage on a commercial real estate property, the debt holders are always going to say, we are giving you this financing for a specific purpose. If you were to change the purpose of this property, then either the covenant would say we would have to talk and renegotiate or worse, we would want our money back and then we would want to underwrite the mortgage once again. Another loss of flexibility is what if you want to sell the asset? Usually the debt holders are going to say that if you sell the asset, as I've already mentioned, I think once in the context of capital budgeting, there is going to be a so-called do on sale clause, which is going to say, if you sell the asset, then uh, I, uh, my financing uh, has to be uh, repaid reimbursed immediately. And the reason for this is when I underwrote this particular loan, it is you that I had in mind, not some other owner. And I would have to underwrite the credibility of this new um, owner. And the key here is that flexibility is valuable. When I engage in an investment project, I may discover two years down the road that um, on the one hand, uh, uh, I want to, the, the purpose that I had in mind initially no longer makes sense. And I would like maybe to tweak uh, that particular purpose instead of being a pure office building, maybe mixed use would make more sense at this particular point. And this is something that I would like to be able to do without having to go sit down with a banker and convince them that that is a fair and safe way to use the financing that they uh, gave me. Or worse, I may decide to abandon the project. I may, be, I may decide that I want to bring in a partner. I may decide that I want to sell the project. And all of that is going to be more difficult if there is a piece of debt which is secured by that particular particular asset. So here, yet again, we are lucky to have the world authority on this area of academic research in um, at the University of Wisconsin in the finance department. As a matter of fact, his name is Antonio Mello, and I encourage you to read his um, papers in this area. Okay, so this was uh, point number three in this rapid fire discussion of what do we know what have we learned in corporate finance since uh, Modigliani and Miller? And there is one more uh, that I want to discuss. And this one happens to be near and dear to my heart because this is basically half of the uh, research that I've done in finance over the past uh, 10, 15 years. It's been about um, this idea. So this idea is that debt holders uh, bring not just money 
typically to the table, but they also bring skills. So the general idea to start at the top is that financing is never, almost never just money. It's almost always a combination of money and expertise. When you bring a new financier in the capital structure, they are going to uh, become part of the corporation. By definition, they are a stakeholders. And if they happen to have skills that are useful to the management of the corporation, uh, uh, or to the uh, yes, to the to the management of the corporation, this is something that is going to create value. One of the prime examples of this, and this is one area in which I've written um, one paper is venture capital. Venture capitalists, uh, the people who provide financing to um, budding entrepreneurs, uh, almost never simply write a check. Beyond writing a check, they are going to meet frequently with the uh, entrepreneur and they're going to, in fact, want to be consulted on a frequent basis and they're going to provide direct advice on you know how the um, venture should proceed uh, about taking products to markets and the like so again this idea here is that sometimes when we bring people into the capital structure it is not only in fact it's not mostly about the money it is about the skills that they bring so i want to give you a specific example of this which comes from uh, another paper of mine, which is a joint paper with Antonio Melo. It is called a backup quarterback view of mezzanine of mezzanine uh, finance. It's in real estate economics. You can find it on my webpage, but I'm going to tell you the story here anyway. So what's the story there? So in the commercial real estate industry, a lot of deals look like what is being depicted here on this uh, chart. So first of all, what's a real estate deal? A real estate deal uh, involves the purchase of a real estate uh, property, which is going to be owned and uh, typically also operated by a um, by one entity. And that entity I'm going to refer to for reasons that will become obvious as the mortgage borrower. So usually those borrowers, those real estate specialists, those operators, um, they have the following features. They know real estate. They know how to operate real estate. They know how to market real estate. They understand the market in which they are doing business. They are real estate specialists. So the skills that they have are real estate skills. But typically, they do not have in, uh, uh, the, uh, on their own enough money to finance all the projects in which they want to um, invest. And so uh, they're going to need to bring to the table almost always at least what we call a senior lender. So this is typically going to be a bank or a, another type of large financial institution. And the senior lender is going to make a loan to the mortgage borrower. And against that loan, they're going to get two documents. One is they're going to get a promissory note, uh, a pledge, which is basically a document that is going to say that for the next 30 years, you're going to make those exact payments uh, at this exact frequency. And this fraction of the payment is going to be principal. And this fraction of the payment is going to be interest. If one day you buy a home, you will see that this is a very, the promissory note is a very, very long document. And it's a long document because it literally stipulates every payment that is going to be made at every point in time and um, and the like. So they get a promissory note, obvious, but almost always in real estate. And that's because the underlying asset is super tangible. So that makes sense. The senior lender, in addition to the promissory, promissory note, is going to get what we call a lien or more commonly known as a mortgage. So uh, the, the mortgage is basically going to be a document, a contract, let's say, that if you fail to deliver on the payments that we stipulated, or for that matter, if you fail to deliver on any aspect of the contract that we wrote. So for instance, the contract is always going to say, you, the mortgage borrower, had better keep the property in good shape because I'm the lender and I need that securing asset to be in good shape. So for instance, if you fail to do that, 
or if you fail to pay, like I said, if you fail to uh, abide by any aspect of this contract, then I'm going to get a, a, the right to accelerate payment. Uh, it means I'm going to demand uh, that you pay immediately uh, the entire loan. And if you are unable to do this, I actually get, uh, I, I, I have the right to force a sale of the property, something that we call a foreclosure. So in other words, I the control rights of the property become mine. And so this is what, again, we call the lien. So this is it. So this is one possible arrangement in real estate, which involves just a senior lender and a mortgage borrower and a property. And, uh, and that's it. But very often in real estate, what you find is in addition to this senior lender, a bank, uh, which the bank again is the person with money, but it's also a person that does not know real estate uh, very, very well. My banker friends get mad when I say this, but it's true. Uh, bankers often think that they know real estate, but if you look at large banks that provide most of the senior lending in real estate, when they have to operate real estate, which they had to do a fair bit in 2008 during the crisis, we discover that they are not very good at it. And in fact, not nearly as good as the um, uh, uh, the, the people who operate properties for a living. It has to do with uh, specialization on your comparative advantage. A senior lender is there to lend money. They are not there to run real estate. Um, so in any event, we have this senior lender here and they have tons of money. They could certainly finance the entire purchase of the property if they wanted to, but somehow very often appears in the capital structure another lender so this is going to be a junior lender and that junior lender uh, is typically going to be known as the mez uh, mezzanine uh, lender and what is odd about them is that oftentimes they bring in relatively little money to the table. I mean, it is rare that the MES contribution exceeds 10% of the financing of the property. So usually senior lenders are going to finance between 60 and 80% of the purchase of a property. And what we see is in many cases, MES people add another five to 10%. So what is odd about this is of course, the senior lender does not need the MES lender to do this. They certainly have, we're talking very, very large lenders here. If they wanted to finance 90%, they could finance 90%. But instead, they choose to only finance, say, 80% and to have the MES lender uh, bring 5% to the table. So why is that? Why do they need the MES lender? So, I mean, one way to see it, to say this is that you know, this extra 5% may actually be the difference between the mortgage borrower being able to provide the equity that they need and them not being able to do this. So if they get another 5% from a mezzanine lender, uh, they only have to finance 15% of the pro project with their own money rather than 20%. Of course, that kind of makes sense. And some of that is certainly true in reality. Um, but we believe, uh, I believe certainly, that there's much more to this, uh, to, to this story than just another 5% uh, to, to the mortgage borrower. So what's the rest of the story? The rest of the story is that those MES lenders, in, unlike the banks that provide the senior lending, they are real estate specialists. And in fact, this is something that we document, Antonio and I, in our paper on the subject. There's a key difference between those guys and those large banks. These are people who also, in addition to provide mass lending, typically operate properties on their own. If they are not operating properties now, they've done so in the past. They are real estate specialists. So now, given that they are real estate specialists, it is um, kind of obvious that they bring a lot to the table. For instance, from the point of view of the senior lender, and again, to repeat my controversial claim that they don't know much about real estate, let's assume that it's true. That they don't know much about real estate. When a senior lender sees a mess lender willing to contribute to this venture, what this is telling you is that the venture makes sense because those people are specialists and they can tell bad investment from good investment much better than the senior lender. So this is the screening value of having a junior lender in the capital structure. So this is an idea that was formalized by two Nobel prizes, prizes uh, in uh, the 1990s, Jean Tirol and uh, Bent Armstrong. Uh, this is in a 1997 paper. They said 
probably the key reason to bring a junior lender into a capital structure and making the capital structure more complex in the process is that those people have a superior ability to separate good investment from bad investments. So we have people that have a lot of money but cannot tell good investment from bad investments. If they manage to bring in to convince a specialist to come lend money with them, they're getting the screening value of that decision. So that's obvious. And then what Antonio and I did um, a couple of years ago, we said that in addition to those screening skills, those monitoring um, uh, skills, those mezzanine lenders are bringing to the table backup operating skills. So why is that valuable? As I mentioned, the uh, uh, senior lender has a security which is uh, provided by the mortgage here. So that means that if the mortgage borrower misbehaves, fails to pay or decides not to work as hard as they should, um, the senior lender has the ability to um, claim the property, but then they inherit the property. And as I said, they're not very good at running the property. And uh, so uh, so that alone is going to destroy value. The fact that we are going from a good operator of the property to a bad operator of the property. So it would be good if there is somebody else on the team which could instead uh, inherit the property if the uh, property if the mortgage borrower uh, underperforms and if you look at the way mess contracts are set up in reality you discover immediately that they are discovered they are set up exactly to uh, provide uh, this those backup operating skills mess lenders issue a loan not to the mortgage borrower but instead to a holding company which is going to own the mortgage borrower which in turn owns the property. So when they foreclose on, um, if for some reason the mortgage borrower is unable to make payments to the mezzanine lender, they foreclose on the holding company, which uh, turns out to come under a completely different legal arrangement from mortgages that are governed by state laws. This turns out to be a very expeditious and cheap foreclosure type compared to the mortgage foreclosure that senior lenders have to go to through because they have a direct lien on the physical tangible property. So this happens much more quickly and much more cheaply. And the mezzanine lender forecloses on the holding company. They remove the borrower from um, uh, the picture and they become the owner of the property. So this is exactly what happens in practice. And in fact, if you look at the inter-creditor agreement between the MES lender and the senior lender. The, the writing in the document specifies exactly those contingencies. So bringing a mezzanine lender into the capital structure is not, according to that theory, so much about bringing money to the table. It is about bringing backup operating skills in a world where we have two problems. One is that foreclosing on a property is extremely costly in the United States by law. Uh, it can take up to a year to recover the property. Uh, many, many lawyers have to be, I mean, a lot of money has to be spent on lawyers, etc., etc. Foreclosing on a mortgage is a catastrophe for a senior lender. And in addition, the senior lenders do not have the skills that they need to operate the property once they recover it, so they would have to go find another operator. It's just a disaster. Whereas those specialists here, in fact, in my view of the world, often land with an eye towards owning the property if the first uh, borrower fails. So that for those people, recovering the property is not a catastrophe like it is for senior lenders. Okay, so this was a long story and in the process I uh, self um, selfishly advertised my own work. But the bottom line is that uh, oftentimes financing is not just financing. When people lend money to a corporation, it is oftentimes a blend of money and of skills. And this is going to be especially true for junior financiers that have that typically uh, happen to be specialists in the industry uh, in which they are lending, unlike the people who buy, who provide the senior and secured financing to corporations. Okay, so good. So enough uh, advertising of my work. And now we that leaves us with exactly and only 
one idea to discuss in this chapter and then we will be done and this is the so-called pecking order view which is associated with Myers and Majlof uh, and this, that 1984 uh, paper in which they first formulated their ideas and so this idea here is very simple this view says that for the purpose of financing new investments companies should and do prefer to raise funds in a very very specific order they should always use internal funds first retain earnings then they should go to debt and within the debt spectrum they should first issue safe debt as in highly rated low interested interest debt then if they must they can issue uh, debt with lower ratings and then eventually hybrids and then finally the last resort should be equity okay so this is a view which makes a lot of sense and it makes a lot of sense for obvious reasons first so i want to discuss those obvious reasons first raising external funds is costly so it makes sense that issuing debt and equity should come after using internal funds if i have already the money in place and i need to finance a new investment it would sense to return that money to my external stakeholders and then ask them to lend that money to me uh, again okay so this is obvious reason number one obvious reason number two if you look at flotation costs the costs the transaction costs associating with issuing debt uh, uh, rather than issuing equity it is more costly to raise equity the transact it takes longer it is it takes more paperwork um, you have to pay investment banks more so the net cost of issuing equity is higher than the transaction cost as associated with issuing debt so if you are going to go to external uh, uh, financing then you should go with debt first rather than equity and I'm not going to um, get into the pecking order part of why you should go safe rather than risky but the ideas are essentially the uh, the same and and i'm happy to discuss them with you if you are interested later okay so we have all that obvious stuff obviously use your internal funds first because it's cheaper because it's already there why do the round trip of returning the money to your um, stakeholders only to ask for that money again down the road but then there is uh, a more subtle and probably more important reason why issuing equity should be done last. And this has to do with asymmetric information. Shareholders, or at least the managers who represent those, share those shareholders, they have superior information about the quality and the prospects of the corporation. So that means that when they decide whether or not to raise equity they can use that superior information and so for instance if they know that good news are about to come down the road and therefore equity right now is undervalued if equity is undervalued and um, uh, we, we know that the market is going to come around eventually to realizing that it is undervalued then I should wait I should not raise equity today conversely if I know that bad news are coming and equity um, values are uh, um, relatively high today that equity is overvalued given the superior information that I have now is a good time to raise equity because if I wait another few weeks then I'm going to be able to uh, uh, it's going to be more costly for me to raise equity because the price of equity will have by then corrected so this is the very simple idea of um, uh, that Myers and Majlouf uh, formalized in 1984 if I see a corporation raise equity what I'm going to infer as an external investor is that the corporation has decided that now is a good time to do so why is now a good time to do so that's because uh, uh, equity in all likelihood is overvalued Okay, very good. So now I have five minutes left in this um, particular video. So what I want to do next is go into a specific example of this asymmetric information problem associated with raising equity. But since I've already spoken for 40 minutes, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to save the math, uh, which is 
a little bit tricky the math for the next video when you are uh, fresh and ready to go so we're going to stop video number eight over here and i'm going to apologize for the very very chatty nature of this um, video but i promise you that i that this will not happen again that we will soon return to our excel ways okay so that's it for today